I'm All sure right. There are new I am not I'm sure there are newbies that will find this yeah. useful. So we are talking about this group of the three of us, and uh, we just said this would be useful to other people. So we're going to start recording. Um, and I've just repeated that because I said that a minute ago, but it wasn't recording. So future watchers of this, welcome. Um, we were talking about the opening question is, why does Ember Auto Import exist? And to answer that question, I said, let's go all the way back to the beginning, which is how do HTML pages load and run JavaScript? So background there, which unfortunately now I'm repeating for Dave and Richard because I had the idea of clicking record too late. In general, the way that HTML runs JavaScript is you throw a script tag in your head or at the footer or wherever you want it to be relative to your page loading. That references a script and that script gets executed after it's loaded. In the early 2010s, uh, with lots of practice behind us from the 2000s and earlier, in terms of creating ad hoc modules via immediately invoked function expressions and things like that, a bunch of standards, competing standards emerged, AMD, UMD, et cetera, as ways of kind of formalizing those module patterns and then being able to share them so that you could say, hey, here's a bundle, some blob of JavaScript that I've written. You can use something like require.js, which is the one that Ember happens to use, but there were others as well, to reference all of these together and assemble them and then distribute that to the browser. Basically saying, hey, what if we could use modules like all the other languages that all of us use on a daily basis too, whether that was you know, Java, Java with Maven and everything else, or Ruby with Bundler, et cetera. So Ember App Kit, which was an early CLI and build tool that said, hey, what if we stepped from building things as just referencing everything via the global Ember you know, ember.component.foo, et cetera. What have we started trying to lean into and collaborate with TC39 and others about like leaning into a modules spec for JavaScript? And Ember did that, as did others. The ECMAScript modules spec came out. But happening at the same time in parallel, Node was going from this tiny little experiment in 2010-ish, 2009-ish, when it first started into the world-eating behemoth monster that it is today. And it had its own module system, the require system, uh, rather the, yeah, the require system, which is different than require.js. I had to think about it because we have imports and we have require now both mm -hmm. in node space. And <coughs> the front-end ecosystem and the node back-end ecosystem were very different things at that point in time. Um, front-end ecosystem, started experimenting with using Node, but had a, a long history of using Bower. Um, Bower had the idea, which is actually very good and helpful, that basically Highlander rules, there can only be one. And so it would restrict you to say, you can only have one version of this thing, which honestly for a front-end app is more or less what you actually want. You don't want to ship seven different copies of Ember components down because you happen to depend on, you know, you and your transitive, you and your dependent, can't speak, you and your dependencies <laughs> transitively depend on it, uh, different versions. All of this led to a world in which there were no existing shared standards across the board. Um, there were ad hoc build tools built on top of things like Grunt and Gulp and Ember App Kit, then Ember CLI pulled together a bunch of these ideas, identified broccoli as here's a good way of kind of mapping, here's a <laughs> bunch of files we want to know, you know, we want to try to do minimal work. Mm. Broccoli is, some people have accurately described it as like React for the file system. You have some set of imports or uh, inputs, you have some set of outputs and you do a diff with caching you can layer on top, et cetera, of the input so that you only make whatever set of changes you need to to get your new set of outputs when something changes. Uh, think of it as virtual file system rather than virtual DOM, and you have roughly the right mental model for Broccoli. Uh, within a few years of Broccoli itself coming out and being chosen by Ember CLI, and in our case, what we would do there is take that and basically turn all of those things on disk your modules that you're doing imports and exports from into AMD modules that we wrap up and provide the definitions for as required JS in the browser. But we were doing this from Bower and from NPM when we started. Mm -hmm. So we had to have some custom resolution for it. 
We basically had to say, here's how to know, you know, when I write import foo from bar, where is bar on disk? Because Bower's doing one thing, Node's doing something else. It could be something you vendored in and just copied into your repository. We need some way to describe that. So Ember CLI defined the app.import semantics that let you say, hey, this name represents that location on disk. So when you type import foo from bar, go look up bar over there. And that was fine. It was a good idea. And there wasn't any standard at the time to use. Within two to three years after that, a standard had emerged, namely Node and the Node module resolution algorithm. And tools like Webpack came out in this era, built on top of that, and basically said, we can walk your graph of dependencies following the Node module resolution algorithm. Mm -hmm. So you can just NPM install something, and you can import that somewhere. And you can tell us your entry points, JavaScript files, index.html that points to a root JavaScript file, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we'll just follow that graph. So we'll go out and walk that and resolve everything. And we'll just use node modules resolution to do it. And mm -hmm. you can layer further resolution rules on top of that. But fundamentally, Webpack, Parcel, et cetera, all of these build tools, bundlers, which are, again, getting back to what we were talking about, they're ultimately about this notion of, we're gonna bundle all of this into one app.js, vendor.js, et cetera. Um, those all use the node module resolution algorithm. Ember CLI, mm -hmm. having helped pioneer this and then not wanting to break everybody, did not use that because all the existing add-on in ecosystem didn't use that. It used this app.import semantics, which predated that having been standardized. Mm -hmm. Now. Great, but it's been standardized now. The entire front end ecosystem works this way for the last four or five years, at least. So a few years ago, uh, Ed Faulkner built Ember Auto Import, which basically says, hey, we can just connect Ember CLI in this complicated chain we've had to any existing open source built bundler like Webpack. Um, and that's what Ember Auto Import does. It basically wires up Ember CLI and its way of knowing how to resolve things and how to bundle things up and shove them out, plus Webpack's knowledge for all of that to say, oh, you can just import things from NPM because Webpack knows how to do that and we can connect the two. Okay. And fundamentally then, you no longer have to go through these old school app.import shenanigans where you're mm -hmm. custom telling Ember, hey, go use the node resolution semantics for this. It's just like, yeah, Webpack knows how to do this. Ember auto import, therefore, connects the two and therefore you can just import it rather than having to go through the shenanigans that we all who've been around Ember long enough, but not for new people to Ember, thankfully. Right, yeah. You used to see Ember dash any node package you can think of. So instead of just saying import whatever from Lodash as a utility mm -hmm. library, you would have Ember Lodash, which would wrap Lodash with app.import semantics and make it possible yeah. to go do that. And that was necessary yeah. when we started. It's yeah. not necessary anymore. And these days, you don't do that. You just have Ember auto import installed out of the box and mm -hmm. just use it. And fundamentally, auto Ember auto import becomes basically a polyfill for mm -hmm. uh, Embroider, which says, hey, we're going to keep the good parts of Ember's add-on ecosystem and mm -hmm. the good parts, uh, and, and specifically the good parts for today, because there were a lot of things that were good parts seven years ago that don't matter anymore because right. the ecosystem has moved and there are new things we can do. Um, but fundamentally, we can say, hey, there's still some great things about Broccoli and that virtual file system mental model where we're going to diff the changes and minimize the set of build stuff we do, et cetera. Mm -hmm. If you do that right and do that with good caching, you can get, <clears throat> get outstanding performance. So in our case, we're all supporting an app with 2.1 million lines of JavaScript and we're at a spot where a cold build is, thanks to one of our colleagues work like six minutes um, and a, like that, a warm yeah. build is like three for building the whole thing. That's actually pretty good in this space to do a, a an end-to-end -end build of the entire thing. Yeah. And we're no longer even gated on that side. We've got other things that are our, our long pull. But the net of it is going into Embroider, everything will ultimately be funneled through Webpack or something else that's compatible with the node module mm -hmm. resolution algorithm. So we could hypothetically, and hopefully in the future will, swap in something like ES build, where it's like, hey, this is 10 to 100 times faster than Webpack. Um, but again, 
that's fundamentally because the all of these new tools lean on the node module resolution algorithm for what does it mean to import foo from bar and once we get into that world and we teach the entire ember ecosystem hey this is you know your layout on disk needs to be compatible with the node module resolution algorithm mm -hmm. which normal node modules all are by default but because that didn't exist so the one last piece of useful context in history here is when ember add-ons were being designed originally uh, the node module, as we said a minute ago, the node module resolution algorithm wasn't a standard and we were using multiple package managers, so we couldn't depend on it. So we designed something that gave you a nice clean separation in some ways between your authoring location, which is app or add-on, and, you know, that doesn't have to be the same point on disk that you resolve it. And actually, Node is getting that feature via its exports key, which allow you you to teach node and the node module resolution algorithm hey when i import foo from bar go look that up in you know bar slash dist instead of bar and that allows you to have a much richer module structure within that but up till this point and that's still not fully finalized you haven't been able to do that in node so if you wanted your stuff to work with nodes module resolution it all had to be in the root or mm -hmm. everything had to funnel through uh, basically be re-exported through an index.js that was relocated somewhere else. So we just had this kind of impedance mismatch between Ember says you can have this kind of layout on file system. Node doesn't like that. And Embroider takes us and says, hey, the layout you have on file system in whatever you publish, and that's important, your authoring format can still be different, but whatever you publish needs to be a node module resolution compatible format on disk. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then you no longer have to think about these differences because the differences are gone. Whatever your authoring format is, doesn't matter. What's on disk is node module resolution algorithm resolvable. So all of these tools just work basically for free. Um, that's the big picture background, etc. I have gone for like 12 minutes straight though. So questions that that raised comments, etc. I think what I'm hearing is for historical reasons and reasons related to, I guess, Ember predating like, um, nodes module resolution algorithm becoming the standard. Yep. Um, some magic was required in Ember to tell it how to find things, but that Ember auto import kind of says, hey, we don't really need that magic because we can push it out to the bundlers who know how to do that. Is that close? Yeah, I would tweak it slightly. And I would say that Ember Ember was never actually it was a case where Ember was a very unmagical. You had to do all this extra work and yeah, be yeah. very explicit and do, you know, I'm going to define my module.exports as an object that defines, you know, that says app.import this path or whatever. And in some ways, Ember auto import makes it more magical, makes it just work because it basically does that work for you for anything in the node modules ecosystem. When we get to embroider, all the magic is gone because everything is just on disk where you would want it to be. Is there any reason today then why any Ember app would not want to use Ember auto import? I mean, do you just get Basically, into every... no. Okay. All right. And in fact, it's part of the default blueprint that gets installed when you initialize a new Ember app or add on and has been for like a year or 18 months, maybe more. And I actually hit this yesterday. I was working on a little package I published last night and I thought I could just delete Ember auto import because I, did, I was like, ah, I don't need that. Right. And the funny thing is I, it's not, we haven't flipped the switch to where your add-on actually works in node modules mode and where CLI uses embroidered by default yet. And so I went to try to, you know, say, oh, I can delete that. I don't need it. But there was a package I was using, which I had just NPM installed the package and thought, oh yeah, I can just use this. And I was only using it in tests and happily I caught it very quickly, but I wanted to pull that package in and use it in my tests and my test stopped working. And I was like, what the heck? Why can't I import? All right because we're still using Ember CLI, what you could think of as Ember CLI classic, not embroider. And I need Ember auto import so that things I've NPM installed just work and automatically get connected, wired uprightly into Ember CLI's resolution of defining modules in the re AMD format to pipe through into require JS to actually deliver into the build. And notably, 
everybody does that last step. It's just that different people do different things. Like if you go look at a React app and the way its bundles are all lined up by Webpack or by Parcel or whatever, they're still doing that same basic thing of I'm going to define a module in one of these formats. AMD is still common. Others are still common. And off the top of my head, I don't remember what the default for Webpack is. But they're still doing that same thing. The trick is we need to auto import to teach Ember how to make that just work today. Once we're in Embroider, that all goes away because it just works by default because that's how everything works. Um, to kind of move this a little bit, one of the things yeah. that, that you went through kind of quickly on mm -hmm. some of the historical stuff that I still don't quite understand is this whole re-export. Because mm. I hear people yeah. talking about re-export all the time. And... So you'll, in a lot of situations, you have some bundle of internal modules, right? And then what you'll do is you'll have your index.js in your node module, mm -hmm. and that will import those things and then export them again. And the key here is that nodes and JavaScript's notion of what a module is, is it's basically just a frozen object. You can't change it but it is fundamentally an object that has a runtime existence. And so you can import it and you can export it. And there's actually shorthand syntax in the ECMAScript modules spec that allows you to just write expo export foo from yeah. bar. Um, and so you're basically saying in this module, I'm just taking that thing and re-exporting it. So that module exports it, now I'm exporting it as well. And that can be really useful for having you know, some bundle of private internal details, which are useful for you for your organization of mm -hmm. your library, but you don't necessarily want to expose all of that. Maybe you only mm -hmm. want to expose a handful of things. So your index.js or some series of top level modules that are public will take and re-export your private things from your private internal layout in whatever you want your public API to look like, whatever those mm -hmm. imports are. So an example of this in Ember's internals is you have a bunch of stuff that's all laid out in whatever way is most convenient and useful for working with it as kind of a big thing. Mm -hmm. And then you have these, what you can call facade packages. I was gonna which, say, this sounds exactly like a Java facade. It's exactly right, yeah. Okay. And they're basically just, okay, let me provide a re-export of those things in a facade pattern. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that for some reason I was hanging up on that. But yeah, as soon as I as soon as you said that it's re exporting something else that I brought in internally as part of my what essentially is my API. Yeah, the, or yeah, then it all makes public, sense. Yeah, it's my public facing. Yeah, it, it's a facade completely. So yep. you're doing you're essentially doing things by composition. Mm hmm. Okay. And then the other piece of it is Node, I mentioned that Node has this new exports spec mm -hmm. that allows you to say, hey, resolve everything from the folder dist. And it mm -hmm. actually allows you to get much more granular than that and say, resolve this path here and that path there, mm -hmm. um, which could be useful in some scenarios. The key for these purposes is that historically, if everything were in the root of your package on disk, you could use nested paths. So you could look up via the node module resolution algorithm. You could say import foo from bar slash baz. And as long mm -hmm. as there were baz.js in the root of foo or like node modules slash foo or node modules slash foo slash bar slash index.js, mm -hmm. either of those would get resolved as that thing. But if you tried to put that in a dist directory or something like that, that yeah. would not resolve. Even though Node has this idea of here's the entry point, it's, mm -hmm. um, its main key, and that allows you to do that for one file, but it didn't allow you to do it for a nested directory. And so people would often use mm -hmm. that, use it, you know, they would often say, look, I want this to live in dist. I don't want to dump it all into the root directory to publish it. That's just weird. It's hard to manage. Mm -hmm. And so what you would often end up with is packages that would have a main, which pointed to something like dist slash index.js mm -hmm. and index.js would then re-export everything else that's in dist so that you can actually resolve it. Because otherwise you have to do something like import 
Fu from node mo you know, from bar slash dist slash nested path, et cetera. And you don't want okay. that. Yeah. So that's the other place where re-exports come up a lot. Um, okay. Yeah. No, that's super helpful. Thank you. Cool. I have to drop, but we're going to keep doing these and we'll just keep uploading them as long as they're talking about open source things or whatever. So hopefully they'll be yeah. useful to other people out there. Yeah, no, I think it's a great idea to record this. And, and uh, yeah, this is what you just gave us was more information than I originally expected, but it's all very helpful and it, it answers a bunch of historical questions that kind of give me enough background because I spent a lot of time worrying um, I did the package info cache stuff in Ember CLI, which yeah. basically meant I had to get way into the node resolution <laughs> algorithm stuff for a long time. Yep. And um, so I have pieces of what you just said mm -hmm. are things that I was doing a while ago. And then there's all this other stuff that's way before my time. Yeah. And one of the things I hope you know, for Ember going forward, and that should, I think, be a goal just philosophically for anything is like, as software developers, having the history in the context is basically always going to make us better. But I also mm -hmm. want it increasingly to be the case that we and this is one of the things I'm looking forward to with embroider, that, like, it's nice to know, and sometimes it can help in particular scenarios. But the mm -hmm. more we can make it so that what you actually do as a working developer in app, out of app, working on build pipeline, et cetera, doesn't need to know all of the historical context. Right. That's something we should aim for. We're not there yet. Yeah. Like I spent a bunch of yesterday explaining things about like why are routes and controllers the way they are to an engineer who'd been working in Ember apps for half more than half a decade. And I was like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's weird actually. And if you know all the history, it's like, okay, now I understand that. But what we want to get to is a point where you don't have to know all the history for it to make sense because it just makes sense using today's stuff. Yeah. And knowing the history then maybe becomes a superpower, but you don't need it to be effective like as a day-to-day -day level. So yeah. it's kind of it reminds me some of uh, when I was learning physics. Yep. And I I I love reading physics and and astronomy and cosmology and all this stuff. But the really interesting stuff was to rather than getting the sanitized version of, hey, somebody did an experiment 100 years ago. It's like, I want to see what they did to go work through the mental process yeah. of figuring out yep. what they did. And, and learn how they got, like, uh, you know, booted from the church because they're <laughs> uh, used uh, <laughs> or yes, beheaded right. or whatever. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. So, thanks a that lot. Was great. Thank you. Yeah. More soon. Look forward to yeah. it.